The next uh, speaker is uh, Francesco Palmirani from the uh, University of uh, Trent. And uh, Shaping the Glitch, Optimizing Voltage Fault Injection Attacks is the title. Thank you. Thanks, Guido, for the introduction. So this talk uh, is, uh, as you can see, about fault injection attacks. So just a brief uh, introduction to the topic. Uh, well, in the case, let's say that we have a microcontroller which has a perfect firmware without any you know, uh, software vulnerabilities. And still, we want to exploit some hardware vulnerabilities to, let's say so, create new bugs. Okay? And basically, what we want to do is to alter the intended execution flow or, in general, the behavior of your device. Um, how do you do that? Well, actually, you inject the system, the device, so with some internal or external stimuli. This stimuli depends on the technique. There are non-invasive techniques, invasive techniques. Invasive in the sense that usually you have to decap the chip and you know probe or tamper with the silicon itself. And this stimuli can be the clock, the voltage, uh, EM, uh, focus ion beam, laser, you know, heat, flashlight, and so. Um, usually in CPU, what you do, you skip instruction, you corrupt some memory registers, you influence some decisions. It depends on the, the attack and the technique. Um, of course, you do this to bypass of security measures, to leak uh, crypto keys, uh, or to create some side channels. Again, it depends on what you want to do. So, okay. This talk uh, is specifically about voltage, fault injection. Uh, yeah, it's quite one of the first techniques, uh, uh, one of the vo first fault injection techniques, but still, it's quite widely used because it's easy, it's cheap, and as you can see here, this is the crowbar setup, which is, I guess, the most common, the typical, the classical setup. And uh, yeah, it's very basic and low cost, so everyone can do this kind of attack. Uh, it, it, when I want to inject a glitch, basically you do, you, you trigger the MOSFET, uh, it closes, uh, you short circuit the uh, VDD to ground for a very brief period of time, and you create this little negative spike in the, in the power supply. Uh, and this is called the, the glitch, okay? and this caused the CPU to misbehave or the device to misbehave. So, uh, yeah, this, uh, this setup is good. I mean, it's widely used, uh, works for most of the cases, but uh, also gives you little control over the glitch parameters because, uh, you know, you can just vary the uh, duration of this glitch and uh, the time where you inject the glitch, of course, uh, and with some more hardware, you can also adjust the amplitude, but nothing more, okay? And the point is also unpredictable in the sense that uh, you can see it's quite noisy, the, the waveform, because you are overshooting, undershooting, and things like that. And also it depends uh, on every time you change uh, the target or something in the circuit, uh, the, the, the shape changes, and you don't know what to expect until you, you try, okay? The point is it changes with the MOSFET that you use, the, the, the PCB capacitance, inductance of the traces, and so on and so forth. So uh, the point, the main one of the first motivation behind this work was that yes, I know uh, voltage fault injection is old, boring. There are better techniques. Uh, we all know that. Still, it is widely used. Okay, so we should not underestimate that also because it's cheap to to do now. And the point is that we wanted uh, at the time to show that you can do also not just simple attacks where you have just to skip, you know, one single check, security check, and you need one of a few glitches. You can also do some complex attacks using this technique without moving to more advanced technique. And uh, uh, to do so, we needed a new setup because, uh, you know, uh, when you are mounting some complex attacks, you never know if the attack doesn't work because of a bug, because of a logic flow, because, you know, the, 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 the wrong alignment of the stars, I don't know, okay, or things like that, or just because the glitch isn't wrong, okay. So we needed more control, uh, we needed more stable and repeatable results, okay. And also we wanted to control every aspect of the, um, the attack in software in order to be able to tune, to optimize the performance of the attack in an easy way, and still, we wanted something that was low cost, is to build, based possibly on off-the-shelf components so everyone can build. And uh, in fact, this setup cost you about, I don't know, 100, 150 dollars or so, okay, on components. So it's very easy, it's based on digital channel conversion because you want not to, you know, short circuit the 
voltage line, you want to generate the glitch, you want to generate the power supply so you can control all the aspects. And yes, this is not actually a main contribution because you can get some cooler uh, hardware from Riskier, but we wanted to show that you can still do it by yourself with uh, a cheap equipment because this way the, the attack surface is larger. I mean, everyone can do that. So we didn't stop that there because, you know, uh, we said, okay, but, you know, usually you think of the shape of the glitch as a V-shaped or a square or pulse-shaped glitch, but why this can be a glitch? Like, this is soft and gentle. You didn't think about this as a glitch, but actually it, it worked in the paper. We use this kind of glitch for attacking a target, and there is a very specific reason for this, and you can find the detail in the paper. But the point is that at the time, we knew by the literature that rising and falling edges does affect uh, the, the, the performance of the attack, the rising and falling edge, edges of the glitch. And uh, we said, okay, why don't we generalize the approach a bit and maybe for some attacks, some vulnerabilities or some devices, some specific glitch waveform works best than other. So you don't need just to adjust the amplitude and the duration, but the actual shape of the waveform that you inject, okay? And we wanted to test this hypothesis. Uh, the problem is that, okay, we wanted more control and, uh, uh, over the attack parameters, but the point is that we, we ended up having so many parameters that it was uh, uh, very difficult, you know, to optimize them by hand, so we needed an automatic approach, and uh, as such, we developed a genetic algorithm for the job, which is kind of busy, uh, based on the classic selection, crossover mutation, and replacement strategies, of course, adapted for the specific, uh, you know, task. Um, but the point is, uh, actually, when you select a set of points in the plane, you apply cubic interpolation then, so you get your digital waveform, and then the digital waveform is fed to an, uh, uh, an external device, which is an arbitrary waveform generator, okay, which, you know, do the digital to analog conversion, you get the analog uh, uh, waveform, uh, it's then amplified and in injected into the target. Then we use uh, a separate micro, to, you know, to handle all the low-level communication with the target uh, and to synchronize the trigger because you want precise triggering, you want to target a specific instruction in time. And uh, yes, at this point we had the setup, we had a way to optimize the parameter in an efficient way, and now we had to test our two, you know, the, the pot one of the hypotheses was, yeah, uh, does the, the uh, shape of the glitch affect the performance of the attack and on the other hand, can we do some really complex attacks using an old technique like this? And uh, for, this, um, uh, for this reason, we choose this uh, uh, case study in the, in the paper, which is firmware extraction, which is, uh, I mean, uh, quite good because it's important for the uh, researcher because they want to, you know, often extract the firmware to analyze the security of, uh, of the code and for the industry because you want to protect your intellectual property. And uh, in particular, this is my favorite uh, uh, attack in the paper. It is uh, on the Renesa 78K family of microcontroller, which are widely used in the automotive industry. So I guess it's a good uh, target. And of course, it has some integrated flash memory that we are that you want to attack. And uh, it also has an internal bootloader uh, that you use to, you know, program, verify, and do all kind of stuff. And uh, the problem, the first problem is that, you know, the bootloader code is in MassCrom and we couldn't access it, okay? It wasn't ma mapped to memory for the user. So we proceed, proceeded with a fully black box approach in the sense that uh, um, we, we didn't know the bootloader code nor the code that was running on the micro. Um, we just knew that we had this set of API available, which was program, erase, do the checksum and verify and we had some security mechanism built in in the chip. So all commands must operate only on 256 aligned byte memory, aligned because you cannot move, you cannot shift the window, okay? So it will be too easy. And all in, in production device, we, we verified this, all the commands, all the programming and RAISI commands are disabled. So actually what you have, you have just a checksum and verify. And of course there is the voltage supervisor to reset the chip. Uh, so how do we manage to, to dump the, the, the flash? Well, the main problem is that there is no read command, okay, as there is in other microcontrollers. 
And this is a problem because even if the device is unlocked, okay, you cannot read back what you have just written, okay? You can just verify it. Uh, so we tried to use fault injection, okay? And we said, okay, let's try to verify just one byte at a time. So it's easy, you brute force one byte at a time and you, and, and you lose on, fail, of course. Then we try to use fault injection again to calculate the checksum of one byte, and it's easy because as you can see, the checksum is just a subtraction from a constant, which is then x 10,000. So basically the, the, the checksum of one byte is a byte itself, failed. Then again, we try with two bytes, three bytes, until we, 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 we ended up with four bytes, and we succeeded in calculating the checksum, still aligned, so we couldn't move the window by one byte at a time. I don't know actually why four bytes, because I, I don't have access to the code. Maybe there is some checks that we weren't able to, able to bypass, but we tried a lot and a lot. And we, also, we were also able to verify four bytes at a time. So now we have our, an oracle, which is not enough to extract information, and we have the sum of four bytes. This is not enough to extract the full flash memory. So we now have to lick some bytes from the flash memory itself, right? So uh, we have to create some side channel and where from, of course, the checksum computation because this is the only function that gives you a result based on what is stored on, on the memory. So the first glitch, as I said, was used to uh, you know, bypass the check and let it run on four bytes only. And the second glitch was used to you know, uh, tamper with uh, uh, skipping or corrupting the subtraction of just one byte of the four in the loop, okay? So now we have the sum of three bytes, the sum of four bytes, and, you, and it's easy to get the, the, the missing one, okay? So now you might say, okay, it's not that difficult a check, okay? You just iterate for this over and over all, all the bytes and you're done, except it's not the case because we had a lot of timing errors. You know, some of them were, was probably caused, you know, by the clock differences, clock issues, uh, but mainly, I guess it was caused by the synchronization with the, the microcontroller because we synchronized on the bootloader commands that we are sending to the, um, to the microcontroller. And uh, the point is that if you, if you get this 10 microsecond uh, window, okay, if you inject a glitch in there, you, usually you get uh, a result, which is one of the bytes extracted with a given probability. So again, you might say, okay, use statistic metrics, okay, just to, you get the, the, the right one in the, in the right place, okay? The problem is that we had a lot of false positives because when you have timing errors, sometimes you, you target the wrong instruction, you corrupt something, and you get a value that it might not be even in the flash memory itself, okay? So you, we cannot distinguish if you have good values, bad values, and where they belong to. So this is a problem. So how did we solve this? Well, first of all, we calculate the sum of the first uh, four bytes, which like in this case, in this example, is x66 using fault injection. And again, we moved the trigger position in that window, okay, over and over, glitching again, again. And for every byte that we extracted, okay, in this window, we find all the four bytes permutation with the new bytes and the previous one, of course. And the point is that we can do an early out by discarding those permutation, which does not sum to x66. This is non fact, okay. And then for the other, we just have to iteratively, you know, glitching every time the verify command to test all the other combination, and you stop this process when you, of course, get a verify that is successful and you have found the four bytes. Then you move along for the next four, and next four again. This process takes hours because, you know, lots of glitches are involved, but it works. So. And you might think, okay, just script it, let it on day and night, and this is what we did. But during the day, it worked well. During the night, it stopped working. I always say, come on, who is you know, tampering with my attack during the night at the university? It, that wasn't the case because we realized that, yeah, the bootloader was running from the internal oscillator, maybe because it was avoiding you know, the clock glitch glitching attacks. And it, it is known that RC oscillators drift with temperature. The rate in this case is 0.1% per degree Celsius. So. If, the, if during uh, the, day, the day you have a temperature and then during the night it raises by, let's say in this example, six degrees Celsius, which is common if you turn off the, the cooling, the trigger moved by four microseconds. And this is quite a lot if you look at the chart because you can see that you move uh, over this window so you're not getting any bytes anymore. So we could have put you know, all the setup in a you know, controlled temperature environment 
but it was much more easy for us just to measure the temperature, characterize the variation, and compensate for the glitch continuously for the temperature variation. This worked quite well because, uh, I mean, uh, we were able to automatically dump the whole uh, flash memory. The problem is that, yes, here you can see we compared, okay, the times and the performance for our technique and the MOSFET that I showed you before. The Pulse one that uh, actually you can think about as uh, our technique, so generating the glitch, but uh, not with an arbitrary waveform, but a fixed one, just a Pulse, okay, and our technique, of course. The point is that for just 60 kilobytes, the MOSFET takes six days and a half to complete, and our technique takes two days and a half, and a half which is quite a lot, but it still it is a 63% improvement which is not bad if you consider that we are talking about the same fault injection techniques, so this is an optimization. And uh, we are also much more efficient, five times more efficient, because on the MOSFET it takes 18 million glitches to complete the process. On um, our techniques, 3.3 million, which is a lot. And this is particularly important because, yes, this is a very complex attack. And also, in the process, you, you, you might damage the target, damage the chip, and it happened. So you, you want sometimes to reduce the number of glitches because your target might be expensive or difficult to get on the market, okay? And we are also more reliable in the sense that we produce less false positive. Less false positive means less combination to test, and less combination to test means that you have to inject less glitches to verify them, okay? So we are faster, more efficient, and more reliable with respect to the other technique. And uh, here you can see we compared the Okay, the point was now we have kind of shown that there is a correlation between, uh, you know, a uh, uh, um, uh, specific glitch waveform and the performance of the attack, okay? And uh, here we can see that uh, also different vulnerabilities that we used best perform with their own sh um, specific glitch waveform. And all this waveform was automatically found out with uh, the genetic algorithm, so there might be better one, of course, but it, these work quite well. And it is interesting to know, compare them with uh, the, the shapes from the other techniques. And you, you can see that, you know, there is some similarities. The lowest peak is kind of similar, but there are also differences before and after. So I guess that confirmed that the fact that, you know, uh, rising up falling edges does affect the performance of the attack. We actually don't know the, the how the mechanism, how does it work. This is left as a future work because uh, we need some more specific equipment because you have to measure the, you know, the propagation of the signal inside the chip, the silicon, uh, and, and things like that. But now we were, we, at least we are able to say, yes, there is a, still a correlation. So our contribution, uh, summing up are, yes, we studied the effect of arbitra using arbitrary glitch waveform, you know, not just pulse uh, or square, wa square waves uh, for the perform on the performance of voltage fault injection attacks. And uh, yeah, we also provided a method using genetic algorithm to automatically, you know, calculate and derive and optimize all the attack parameters, parameters which are a lot because you have to find also the, an actual waveform. And uh, we not we didn't just just uh, found one attack on the Renesas. We were able to dump the flash of six microcontrollers from three manufacturers: ST Micro, Texas, and Renesas. And finally, we did a comparison with uh, the other voltage fault injection techniques as I show you. So thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. The temperature affecting not only your setup, but the people are freezing. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you plan uh, to open source uh, the setup? So if someone wants to replicate uh, this uh, setup, is it yes. possible? It's easy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's quite easy. S some has, uh, has already emailed me asking about that. Uh, we had the plan. The problem is on one side that we have an NDA uh, with a company about you know the actual code, which is uh, expiring now. And I also I have been a little bit uh, busy because I wanted to do before, but before the end of the year, I plan to, you know, 
uh, provide the schematic and the code and everything uh, on GitHub. So yes. Okay. Question. Ah, thank you for presentation. Um, I think the uh, your uh, arbitrary wave, arbitrary wave generator glitch injection system have a, a low impedance amplifier to inject the power line, power um, plane. Mm -hmm. So I want to know uh, the frequency response of the amplifier and output impedance of the amplifier. Can you repeat, sorry, because uh, the last part just. Uh, output impedance, impedance. Yeah, yeah sure. Mm. How, how the value of the output impedance, you mean? Uh, impedance, uh, yeah, so. Actually, I don't recall the, the exact number, okay, of the output impedance. Uh, well, uh, in our experiment, uh, we didn't uh, use the full PCB. We solder the chip and use a smaller board to you know avoid long traces and things like that and in the chip that actually you can that expose you the internal voltage regulator we bypassed it okay to avoid uh, you know uh, because of course anything that is put in between the generator and the, and the core itself is altering the waveform of course mm -hmm. yes this, this was, I mean, a very cheap setup. Uh, it, it can be do absolutely better. Okay. If also, if you want to raise in frequency and. So, um, the schematic of the uh, amplify amplification system is mm -hmm. avail available online? Uh, yeah, it's actually based on application note from TI. I'm not wrong. I can I can tell you later, but it will be part of the the, the published uh, material online. I, I'll tell you later. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, the speaker again. Thank you. <laughs>